Since I previously talked about the Tempest Federation, it wouldn't be right if I didn't talk about another aspect of the nation that plays a big role in the overall story. And I'm sure from the title alone, you can already tell what today's topic will be. That's right, I'll be doing a complete breakdown on the labyrinth that Remorous created. So as always, this video will contain light novel spoilers for the story of Tensura and you have been warned. Also, if you enjoyed the video and want to see more, don't forget to like the video and maybe subscribe to the channel. <laughs> So how and why was the labyrinth started? Well, basically, Remorous had wanted to move to the Tempest Federation because she was lonely and bored in the dwelling of the spirits. So when she came to Tempest and tried to forcefully build her labyrinth here, Remu decided he could take advantage of it. His intention was after all to attract more visitors to stay in Tempest and spend money here so the labyrinth could be used as a dungeon. He wanted to target adventurers that might use the dungeon as a source of income or to test their skills and merchants that might be interested in the materials obtained from here. Because Remorous and Remu would have full control of the labyrinth, it can even be used to hide the national secrets of the Tempest Federation. So Remu allowed her to build the labyrinth under the Tempest Coliseum and she started construction right away using her intrinsic skill labyrinth creation. This ability allows her to create a near endless labyrinth and customize the floor any way she wants but due to the physical constraints, the maximum she can do is 100 floors. When it was completed, Remu decided to let Remus handle the management of the labyrinth while he supervised and she has given a salary as well, 20% of the revenue to be precise. It took her around 7 days to complete the construction of the 100th floor labyrinth. However, they still had to plan for a few issues before opening the labyrinth. The first was generating monsters and the solution was placing Valdora in the last floor so that he can release his magic cues. The magic cues would then spread throughout the labyrinth with special pipelines and as the magic cues travel upwards, the concentration would be lower thus spawning weaker monsters and vice versa. Another benefit is that Remu won't have to worry about Valdora exposing his magic cues outside and Remorous can borrow the magic cues to maintain the labyrinth. Then there's also the issue of people getting killed inside the labyrinth so Remorous created the revival bracelet, a single-use disposable item. If anyone is killed while holding this item inside the labyrinth, they won't feel any pain or agony and will be instantly transported outside fully revived. The revival process isn't instant and there's a 10 second delay so people with the ability to resurrect their friends can use it if they wanted to. Of course, people will complain if they need to always start over after dying or leaving so for every 10 floors, there's a save point but they have to first defeat the floor guardian. Now, just having a labyrinth won't attract customers so Remote introduced different rewards. The first kind was the treasure chest rewards, three variations can be found. Bronze are the most common, containing items like healing potions or silver coins. Silver chests also contain the same items but there's a chance to acquire experimental equipment made in Kurobe's workshop. And the best are the golden chests, having all the previous mentioned items but are higher grade and more valuable like rare or unique grade equipment. Then where the monster drops, by making newly spawned monsters swallow items or equipment, challengers are incentivized to hunt more monsters. Next is a reward system where the first few teams to conquer any of the floor garden levels will get prize money. It will be renewed every month and is only limited to first time winners, meaning the same person cannot receive the prize money multiple times. Additionally, anyone that conquers the final floor of the labyrinth will receive 100 stellar coins, which is equivalent to around 1 billion Japanese yen and the right to challenge the Demon Lord Remuro Tempest. As for the management of the labyrinth, since the elves, treants and dryads are living inside, they will be serving as the staff. However, they only handle management work because the cleaning is done by the slimes inside the labyrinth. Now, to make sure people behave, Remu and Remorous decided to implement some rules. The obvious one is that they have to pay the entrance fee of the labyrinth, which is 3 silver coins. Another important one is that if anyone is causing trouble and if they are rude towards the staff, Remu or Remorous, they will be brutally executed without the pain suppressing function of the revival bracelet. Then the offender will be revived, kicked out and banned forever. The next rule is that challengers need to have a free guild adventurer's ID or purchase a labyrinth card provided by Tempest for 10 silver coins in order to enter. Once inside, it is also compulsory for people to purchase a revival bracelet. First time challengers get it for free but the next one will cost 2 silver coins. Also, teams can only have a maximum of 10 people but there are people that abuse this rule although they won't be reprimanded. The last rule is an optional one, basically challengers are advised to attend a prep course and lecture before taking on the labyrinth. That said, the labyrinth also has some interesting elements and features, like it can simulate a full day and night cycle and even have different weathers or conditions. Now besides that, Remorous also created various items like the revival bracelet I mentioned just now but there's also the return whistle and recording crystal. The return whistle can be bought for 30 silver coins and is a single use item that allows people to leave the labyrinth while the recording crystal allows for a one-time quick save anywhere in the labyrinth and the item costs one gold coin each. 
Moving on, for people that needed stronger equipment, they can even rent weapons and armor from the shops inside the labyrinth. Now, those are the friendlier features. For the not so friendly ones, we have things like the layout of the floors constantly changing every 2 to 3 days to prevent challengers from memorizing it. There are also the various traps created by Rumuru, Valdra, Remorous, and Milim. They are mostly simple traps like poison arrows, pitfall traps, acid swamps, corrosive gas rooms, razor string corridors, dark levels, terrain effects, and many more. But the traps deployed by Rumuru are definitely the most interesting because it uses slimes. The traps include the slime pool, a passage where made completely out of slime, they will trap challengers, slime rain, having small slimes rain onto them and causing painful acidic burns, and lastly, slime door, basically a giant slime that slowly exhausts their stamina while reducing the durability of their equipment. Traps aside, the labyrinth also has the dungeon dominators, monster avatars created by Rumuru to mess with challengers. It comprises of him as a ghost, Milim as a red slime, Valdra as a skeleton warrior, Remorous as the heavy animated armor, and later they are joined by Milim's pet dragon Gaia. Moving on, let's go through each of the floors within the labyrinth, starting at floor 1. Initially, this was a large area mainly used by challengers to test out their skills before challenging the lower floors, but it was later converted into a tutorial-style training ground to teach them about the labyrinth, and Remorous made it so that no one could die here. There's even a special room designed for veteran challengers to practice fighting different monsters. A separate area for the Tempest Federation army to train new recruits can also be found here. Going down to the 2nd to 4th floor, this is where the real labyrinth starts and is mostly filled with monsters ranging from rank E to F and harmless traps. The treasure chests for these levels contain low-grade items that are helpful for the early game like healing potions, but from the 5th floor onwards, rank D monsters will start spawning and the lethality of traps also increases. However, chances of getting better items from treasure chests are higher as well. Now reaching the 10th floor, the rank B Black Spider will be the first floor guardian and the first 5 teams that defeat it will receive 3 gold coins. They also gain access to the first save point and the golden chest. Now initially a save zone will appear as well but it was later revised so that whenever a floor guardian is defeated, a door that leads to the 95th floor will appear instead. Afterwards, down to levels 11 through 19, the difficulty has been increased. Then going to level 20, the floor guardian is a rank B+, evil centipede, and 5 gold coins are given to the first teams that defeat it. Floors 21 to 39 are the same as before but the frequency of finding fake and higher grade treasure chests are higher. On the 30th floor, an ogre lord with the rank of B+, along with his 5 rank B subordinates will be waiting and the reward for beating them is 10 gold coins, again, first 5 teams. Also, the golden chest from this floor will have a 2% chance of dropping one random item from the Ogre series and after getting 5 armor pieces, users will receive a powerful magic resistance effect. And because floor guardians normally respawn every 30 minutes, challengers can technically just wait to farm the armor. For the floor guardian of level 40 is the rank A- Temper Serpent and this time only the first 3 teams can claim the price of 20 gold coins. Then from level 40 downwards, new prototype slotted weapons and one-time use magic marbles created by Kurobe will start to appear as drops. And floors 41 to 49 are where the traps designed by Rimuru are located. It's a trap! Down to the 50th floor, challengers will face either the floor guardians Gozer or Miser, and both have a threat level of rank A. If they can break through this floor, then they will receive 100 gold coins. Next, beyond the 50th floor, the traps will become more threatening than the monsters and floors 51 through 60 are called the Golem Zone. They are filled with mechanical soldiers that could even use firearms and this area is filled with landmines. The floor 60 guardian was initially just a normal elemental colossus but when Ghidorah joined the Tempest Federation, he was allowed to pilot the elemental colossus as the new floor guardian. Later, he officially joined as one of the floor guardians after the first Eastern Empire invasion. From level 61 to 70, they are filled with the undead and initially it was at level 51 to 60 but after a Dalman was promoted, his floor position was swapped. At the 70th floor is the City of Death, where a Dalman serves as the floor guardian assisted by his friend the Death Paladin Albert, Pet Dragon Venti, and his undead army. Moving on, floor 71 to 79 are large green forest areas ruled by insects, and the Insect Queen Apito serves as the 79th level floor boss. Now for level 80, it is the domain of the Insect Kaiser Zagion, considered to be the second strongest entity inside the labyrinth. Going downwards is the domain of the magical beast with threat levels of rank B or higher. Additionally, level 82 to 90 are also ruled by Nine Head Kumara and her tail magical beast. At level 82, it belongs to a pure white monkey named Byakuren, attacking challengers with wind magic or even melee weapons. For the 83rd floor, it is an open grass plane that belongs to the moon rabbit gat. It uses gravity manipulation to crush challengers but the ability depends on the phases of the moon so it only attacks during night time. Then we have the 84th floor, an area with cobblestone trees and the domain of the black rat Kokuso. It will spread dangerous disease that cannot be killed with magic to kill people. Down to level 85, the Thunder Tiger Raikou uses lightning and it leads the other magical beasts of the floor to decimate challengers. 
Next is floor 86, a desert area guarded by the winged serpent Yoda and it manipulates the composition of the atmosphere to kill its victims. Moving to floor 87, it's a peaceful mountainous region with very low frequency of monsters. The floor boss is the sleeping ship Mink and it bloodlessly kills challengers by putting them into a permanent sleep. On floor 88, it is the domain of the Firebirds and they are led by the flame bird Angel using their flames to burn people alive. At the 89th floor is a maze of unbreakable mirrors inhabited by the mirror dog Igami. It travels using the mirrors, attacking people through the mirrors with physical and magical attacks. Lastly, at the 90th floor is the domain of Nine Head Kumara herself, the floor guardian and queen of the magical beasts. Moving to levels 91 to 94, they are not accessible to outsiders and are mostly used as storage and production facilities. To be more specific, level 91 is a warehouse for storing metal ores and turning them into magic ores through Baldur's magic use. Level 92 has a factory where the magic ores are refined into magic steel. Then level 93 is dedicated to growing hippocute herbs and finally on the 94th floor, there's a honey processing factory. Going down a level to floor 95 where the city of the labyrinth which is home to the elves and treants, it also houses many important facilities like a joint research facility used by the alchemists from Dragon, magic researchers from Sarian, and vampire researchers from Lubarius, but only high level officials are allowed to enter. Then there's also the Elven Cabaret, the top Elven bar in Tempest, and it is only intended for VIPs or important visitors. As for the facilities that are available to the public, where the inns and equipment shops. And to gain access, challengers have to pay 3 silver coins, and once here, they can pay for other services. Staying at the inn, using the laundry service and public bath each costs 3 silver coins, while equipment cleaning and repair services cost 5 silver coins, and prices for meals may vary. People can also find equipment that are exclusive to the labyrinth being sold here. Lastly, this floor has the final save point before challengers go down to floor 96. Beyond floor 96 are the dragon chambers where the elemental dragon lords reside. They used to be arch dragons that Milin captured but later evolved into dragon lords and each floor has a special terrain effect. At level 96, it belongs to Eurus, the Tremor Dragon Lord, and the terrain effect is constant earthquakes. Then level 97 is the domain of the Wind Dragon Lord Notos, and the terrain effects include strong winds and powerful lightning storms. Next, we have the 98th floor where Boreas, the Ice Hell Dragon Lord, resides, and is a literal frozen hellscape. Lastly, floor 99 is guarded by Zephyrus, the Fire Hell Dragon Lord, and the floor is made of fire and brimstone. With that, we finally reached the last floor, and this is where Valdra Tempus, the king and final boss of the labyrinth, resides. His private room is also located here and he uses it whenever he wants to relax in his human form. Besides that, the entrance leading to the home of the spirits can be found here as well among other important facilities. One of these facilities is a large research facility and is divided into several compartments. One is a laboratory for Gabriel and Vesta, and then three private research facilities, one each for Rimuru, Baldura and Remoras. Some of the research done here include Remoras' elemental classes, Rimuru's growth capsule lab, development of the magic train, and other secret projects. The Strategic Military Control Battle Command Center, or simply known as the Control Room, is also another very important facility. This room houses the magical surveillance system Argos, which allows Rimuru to observe whatever distance he wants, and he could even assassinate targets through the use of Megiddo. The room also has a system that allows them to measure the existence value, analyze and record the skills of any individuals that enter the labyrinth. But besides that, the control room also serves as their headquarters during times of war. Lastly, there's a secret meeting room that even Rimuru doesn't know about and only Valdra, Remoras and the other floor guardians know about it. Now surprisingly, level 100 is not the final floor and there's a special protocol that will actually create a level 101. This is only activated during times of war and the entire capital city of the Jura Tempest Federation will be isolated inside of the labyrinth. When this happens, all services in the labyrinth will be halted and floors 91 to 95 will be swapped with floors 96 to 100. During this period, any enemies that enter will not be allowed to leave until they clear the labyrinth. As for the conditions to clear the labyrinth, enemies will need to first defeat all the 10 laws of the labyrinth, the strongest group of individuals inside, and collect the keys. After collecting the keys, they will be allowed to challenge Valdra and they needed to defeat him, which is basically an impossible task. But in the event that Valdra was somehow defeated, the city will be returned to the surface so the inhabitants can escape. The only time this protocol has been activated was during the first Eastern Empire attack when an army of 700,000 led by Kaguro entered, but they were easily defeated by the Labyrinth's defenses. Before I end the video, I want to briefly go over a few notable moments that happened within the labyrinth. The first is when Hinata became the first challenger to ever reach the final floor, but she did do this before the introduction of the 10 laws of the labyrinth, so it was still considered easy. And speaking of the 10 laws of the labyrinth, another notable moment was their introduction. The first iteration had Beretta as the overseer and members included Zagion, Apito, Kumara, Adalman, Albert and the Dragon Lords. The newest iteration was after the first Eastern Empire attack, Beretta had stepped down and giving the role of overseer to Zagion, and the empty spot was filled by Ghidorah. 
Now, one of the biggest moments that happened was when Valgra managed to blow open the labyrinth and completely destroy the top 50 floors. Valdora had also fell under the control of Emperor Rudra during this event, making it the first time the labyrinth actually suffered real damage and was on the verge of destruction. That said, even Fenton King Feltway tried to attack the labyrinth afterwards but his forces were repelled by the labyrinth lords. Now, those are some of the most notable things involving the labyrinth and later on, Ramorous managed to repair the damages and it still appears quite often in the later parts of the story. So yeah, that's everything I managed to gather on Ramirez's Labyrinth and if you have any questions, feel free to share your thoughts down below. This video took a really long time to make and I might have missed some details too but hopefully you enjoyed it. Maybe give the video a like to help out the channel or even subscribe if you want. Thanks for watching and as always, stay safe everyone.